thank you very much and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I think this is a very important um, kind of, of meetings and, and, and with the topic that are of the greatest importance for human health. Um, uh, I will talk as you introduced here about early life, uh, about the human biomonitoring, and we have focused a lot on mixtures uh, of compounds and, and um, also on compounds that are related to different kind of, of food packing, packaging materials. So my outlines here is, I, I, I want to say a few words about single compounds and, and mixtures. Uh, and also about uh, chemicals that we have been focusing on uh, that could be deemed as, as these FCCs as we heard about earlier. Uh, I will say some even fewer words about a method for handling the mixture problem. This is not an easy task, but we have worked a lot uh, with, with people at Mount Sinai in New York on, on this WQS regression. I will say something about that. I will also briefly introduce you to the SELMA study, a pregnancy cohort where we are following almost 2,000 uh, children and, and mothers from early pregnancy up in school age. And I will provide you with some kind of results from this um, uh, study on prenatal exposures for mixtures and, and health outcomes in children later on. So first, a few words about uh, human exposure, biomonitoring, and regulatory guideline values. Uh, the traditional way we have uh, focused on this is to use biomonitoring values, looking at the human exposure, and go, then go over to experimental evidence. And, and historically, this has been very much about animal studies, and now we are trying to go over more to, to in vitro studies. But this end up with some kind of reference to this. Uh, where we say that below this, we are safe or, or, or we can't see any effect. Then we uh, establish for, for compounds, these kind of regulatory ratios. We divide the human exposure with the reference dose, and we put on some kind of an assessment factor. This has been going on for 100 years, very successful, and we have got rid of numerous of dangerous compounds with this approach. One thing with this that is very important to remember is that this kind of risk assessment procedures is based, almost always is based on a single compound approach. This is, however, a problem. This is data from our SELMA study where we have measured um, uh, 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 chemicals in prenatal urine and serum in more than 2,000 pregnant women in first trimester. And don't read the names here, just read, uh, this is six, uh, tw more than 50 analytes uh, uh, related to 26 um, chemicals. Uh, um, and, and the first important thing with this table is to look in the red column to the right. It says in how many in percent of the samples we could identify this compound above detection level. And as you can see here, almost all this, a majority of these compounds were found in all 2,300 plus pregnant women. That means that we are never ever exposed to one single compound. We are always exposed to mixtures. And this is remarkable since the risk assessment is based on the single compound approach. This is a problem. The other thing uh, relate more to what we talked about earlier, uh, these compounds that we find in, in food packaging materials. And of these compounds, we can see here at least four uh, of these chemical types are related very much to food package, um, packaging materials, as we have heard. We have the phthalates, we have the phenols, uh, and not at least the perfluorinated compounds uh, uh, that we know are uh, found in food packaging materials. So just a few words of this uh, WQS regression method to be used in epidemiological studies. This is a method th that can handle this is one of several, but, but uh, can handle the problem with 
the, the thing is that we are not only exposed to numerous of single compounds in complicated mixtures. These single compounds uh, concentrations are all, almost always also strongly correlated to each other. And the WQS regression can handle this kind of, 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 um, of uh, problems. Uh, I won't go into details here, but the point with this is that we can establish, as you can see in the lower right corner, a WQS index for each individual in a cohort study, for example. And this WQS index is based on the rank of the concentrations of, of these compounds in each single subject. And one important thing is that we get the weights. The weights is the importance of each single compound to the WQS index. So a higher percentage means that in this case, MEHP is strongly related, more strongly related to the contributes more to the WQS index than the MINP in the lower part of the table to the in the lower left corner. So we have used this WQS regression and there are much more details on, of this that you can read about, but this is a way to go, go from the single compound approach to a multiple exposure uh, approach. Uh, so the SELMA study, the SELMA study, the basic principle of the SELMA study is that we have measured a lot of chemicals and a lot of other compounds as well in uh, prenatal urine and serum. And we have done that in early pregnancy around week 10 of pregnancy. And then we follow these families and we look on different outcomes of the children uh, later on in, in life. We have looked on uh, birth weight and metabolism, sexual development and brain development. And we try to, to, to um, adjust for, for potential confounding in this. So my first example is about neurodevelopment. Uh, PI of this study have been Eva Tanner, uh, which was at, uh, when we worked with this, uh, she was at Mount Sinai in New York. So we look at this exposure for these 26 compounds in early pregnancy. Uh, and we look on cognitive function in the children when they were seven years of age by the use of, of a psychological test. And in this case, uh, VISC-4, uh, VISC which is a, a validated test. And as you can see, there was quite good distribution in IQ of these kids, mean value of 100, which is expected, and a rather good shape of the distribution curve. Uh, what we found was that there was a prenatal mixture of, of these 26 compounds that were related to a lower IQ at age seven. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the figure, uh, this is from a validated um, analyze, meaning that we, we, we used a train, training set and a validation set. So this is the final results. And we could see that uh, especially for boys, we, we could see different associations for girls and boys, but for boys, we could see a, a reduction in IQ with about two units on this 100 standardized scale, which was related to an interquartile range uh, in the prenatal exposure for this WQS index, which means that this is a reasonable, uh, this is a risk and a two unit in IQ reduction is maybe not seen and could not be observed in a single individual, but on a population level, this is an association to count on. And then of course, which were the single compound that were associated to this? And that is the weights that, that this method established. And as you can see here, the higher bar here, the higher weight, and the higher contribution to the WQS index. And you can see that we could see signals, significant signals from the phenols, uh, not only BPA, but also BPF, which is a replacer of BPA. We could see it from the phthalates and we could see it from the perfluorinated compounds. So here we could see that there was an association between what was seen in, we could relate the mixture during early pregnancy to, to cognitive function in the children at age seven 
and some of these compounds, not to say, I mean, quite a lot of these important compounds for this outcome were, have been associated to food packaging materials. The other story and the example is about metabolism and growth. And here we have the same exposure and we are interested in birth weight, we are interested in growth, and we are later on, we will be, and we are right now interested in BMI of the children. And this has been led very much of Catherine Svensson, which is a PhD student in our group. So this is a big story because this is related back to the so-called David Barker hypothesis. David Barker looked on historical materials and found out that starvation was relating to lower birth weight and another shape of the growth curve. There is very much to tell about that, but I, I don't have time for that right now. But the point is that changing the growth curve and having a low birth weight is a risk factor for numerous of serious diseases much, much later on in life. Cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, and and and, but he never was never ever interested in chemicals. He was interested in starvation. So what we have done done in the Selma is that we have followed these uh, kids from early pregnancy up until school age, and in Sweden we have a very good registry system. So we have collected up to fifteen times of weights from birth up to the age of six year. And these weights, what we have done is to establish trajectory curves for each of the children. And this is indeed a very interesting story in itself that we could, there, there is a function that could cover this with the importance that we have to talk about growth and, and, and talk about growth spurt and we also have to. Uh, we have also investigated when this peak growth peak um, uh, happens in terms of age of the kid. This is very much math, but we 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 have two important papers that we really can can see that we we have good models for this. So what we did was to look on the prenatal exposure for the same compounds, and we related that to three outcomes in the children. The birth weight, as you can see in the, in the table, the infant growth spurt, which is the beta, uh, and the infant age at the peak growth velocity. And we could find associations. This is, first of all, very important that we could, whatever it means, but we change the, the way the kids are growing. And Going back to, as I did before, to the, to, the, uh, to the weights, we can find here all these in, in bold here, they provide, they, they contribute to a certain degree uh, to the WQS index. So again, as in the case of neurodevelopment, we could see that these chemicals and part of them are still food packaging chemicals. They relate to birth weight, and to uh, the shape of the growth curve. So uh, the David Barker hypothesis talked about changing the curve, changing the growth uh, trajectory curves by starvation, which is, which is a matter of programming the metabolic system. Now we have start to get evidence that maybe other environmental factors like chemicals can do the same thing, which is, very, very interesting and, and also, uh, of course, an issue. So the take home message from this is that we are exposed as we did know before, of course, for chemicals that are found in, in, in food packaging materials. One problem is that this kind of exposure is very complicated uh, uh, and, and we should remember that risk assessment based on a single compound approach maybe doesn't cover the real problem. We can handle this kind of problems in, in, in different advanced uh, statistical methods. And what I have shown for you is that we could find mixtures 
in early life uh, that were related to, in this case, two outcomes, both neurodevelopment at the age of seven and weight trajectory from birth up to school age. And finally, I, have, I didn't mention this because of time limits, but the way we have worked a lot with, and especially in an um, EU project, is that we have combined epidemiological studies with experimental uh, studies in, uh, in cell and animal models. And we, we have another finding where you can see that prenatal exposure for a mixture of phthalates was related to a shorter anogenital distance in baby boys. And a, a shorter AGD is a marker of sexual development and a marker of the sex hormone situation early in pregnancy. And uh, we could then repeat that. We took the mixture from the humans and we exposed pregnant mice and we measured the AGD in these male mice offsprings. And we could, support, we could confirm what we found in the, in the epidemiological study. And you can read about that in the, in the reference here from 2019. Thank you very much. That was my... Thank you.